In the latter half of the Second Succession War, the Free Wills League was undergoing a slight shift in its internal boundaries. During the Comstar War, the Maddock Commonwealth had been outvoted in Parliament by rival power blocs, seriously hampering the Captain General's efforts to halt their enemy's advance and counteract the effects of Comstar's interdiction. This was something which his son Gerald Maddock was eager to avoid a repeat of, should he ever find himself in the same boat. The Principality of Regulus had long been a thorn in his family's side. The shift from House Salage to Cameron Jones back in the 27th century having done little to change that state of affairs. The Duchy of Andurian had typically supported the Great House, but could potentially become another rival in the future, as they had grown more than any other province during the Succession Wars. Work to destabilise these provinces had resulted in Regulus losing ten systems, while another eight declared their independence from Andurian. The Maddock Commonwealth, by contrast, picked up another pair of worlds closer to Terra, increasing its number of MPs in Parliament. 2859 saw the end of the almost two-decade-long La Reconquista effort by the Grand Duchy of Oriente. Overall, it had been a tremendous success, but its final year was not so special. Anagasaki and Chengdu turned them back, and while A and Leal were taken, the Capellans enacted a scorched earth policy as they withdrew from the latter. Andurian forces also returned to Aquagia in 2859, over 20 years after they had abandoned it during the Comstar War. To their surprise, they found that FWLM special forces had been leading a popular uprising for pretty much that entire time. The population welcomed the League back as liberators. Loss of territory wasn't Liao's only concern, as Narhol's raiders returned back to Steiner employ after a decade of unhappy service with the Confederation. This loss was softened by the addition of Lothar's Fusiliers to the ranks of the Chesterton Reserves during the 2850s, the last mech regiments to be raised from scratch by the CCAF during the war. On January 20th, 2859, Elizabeth Steiner turned 19. Her birthday celebration saw the Triumvirate peacefully pass control of the realm down to their young ward. To thank them for their faithful service, the new Archon immediately gave them tasks she knew would keep them well away from court, quite content to never see Henri de Calidor or Eliza Atten ever again. The former was given command of the 23rd Lyran Regulars, the only new mech regiment the LCAF would raise during the Long War. The latter was given the Herculean task of overseeing the relief effort for those displaced by foreign aggression. Rebecca Morgan had always supported her daughter, and you can see Elizabeth's gratitude in the contrasting job she gave her mother compared to the others, protecting endangered species with the Environmental Services Department. A few tit-for-tat actions continued along the Commonwealth Combine border in 2859, even after the end of the Marathon Offensive. The former took Atria, the latter Basiliano. The DCMS also contracted the Wild Cards to supplement their abilities in the region. 2860 would see a pair of high-profile casualties for the two successor states. A raid on Sakhalin may have failed to achieve their intended objectives, but it did result in the death of the Lyran hero Henri de Calidor in only his first battle. Further forward, the war griffins had just arrived on Krella after their contract with the Federated Sons had been terminated prematurely. In the final months of 2858, they had conducted a reconnaissance raid on Robinson to assess enemy strength and deployments. The intel was found to be sorely lacking when the AFFS returned to the planet in early 2860 and the war griffins took the lion's share of the blame for the way the counterattack unfolded. Their situation went from bad to worse when the Curitans arrived on Krella in March. The mercs were swiftly overwhelmed, but did manage to exact some vengeance on behalf of Steiner when they killed the despised Hugai Kurita. The few surviving mercenaries fled to the periphery to join up with Hendrik Grimm. One of the most exposed systems along the border was the Tamar Domain's capital. 
Thinking that an invasion was likely imminent, the LCAF dispatched reinforcements to the planet and the staging grounds on nearby Severin. What they had not anticipated was for a trio of Kuritan mech regiments and seven more conventional to hit Sakhalin again for the second time that year. There was little hope of repelling such a large force. The Kuritans further expanded their salient by taking Pilakua by year's end. Two of the most contentious systems along the Marek-Steiner border were again the site of battles in 2860. The Freewelds dispatched the Eridani Light Horse to raid Judone, but this may have weakened their position further along the border. The Lyrans evened the score later that year when Magrez once again switched sides. Fresh defeat at the former Draconis March capital forced Prime Marshal Peter Davian to call a halt to operations along the Kuritan border. While the AFFS reorganised for a much larger effort to reclaim the Robinson Bulge in a few years' time, First Prince Michael Davian tasked Peter with launching another offensive against House Liao. Operation Winter Garden aimed to create a large salient deep into the Capella commonality. The campaign got off to a strong start. The flag of the Federated Sons was soon flying over half a dozen new worlds. On September 19th, the Prime Marshal led an assault force of two battle mech and eight conventional regiments to Camel. This should have been an overwhelming force, as they had yet to come up against any significant resistance. As the dropships descended through atmosphere, they came under withering anti-air fire. Among those hit by the AA that smashed into the planet's surface was Davian's command vessel, throwing the entire operation into complete disarray. As the Capellan Confederation had steadily lost ground to both of its neighbours during the Succession Wars, the realm had become increasingly narrow. Chancellor Lorelli Liao wisely saw an opportunity in this apparent vulnerability. She could hold much of her strength in reserve along the centre line of the Confederation and manoeuvre them to whichever front they were needed far quicker than Davian or Marek would have considered possible in their own territory. This is exactly what caught out Peter Davian, whose attack group had run face first into those reinforcements. The three attacks that were scheduled to begin after Camel were immediately called off as the First Prince raced to restore some semblance of order to the campaign. In mid-October, the newly christened Operation Jade Castle struck again, this time against Alcyone and Daniels, two planets that the Federated Sons had taken all the way back in 2833 as part of Operation Leopard. With momentum on their side, the Capellans looked like they might be about to get the upper hand for the first time since the early days of Operation Kelt. In their hour of deliverance, Fate intervened in the most cruel way. Word of their success made it back to the Jade Palace on Cyan on October 18th. The next morning, Lorelli Liao suffered a stroke. She died 11 days later. Whatever destabilizing effect the loss of the Prime Marshal had had on the AFFS, because of the structure of the CCAF which places the Chancellor at the head of all operations, and makes use of no ranks above Colonel. Lorelli's death at this crucial moment was so much worse. With no children to inherit her position, the Prefectorate selected her brother Danemar to be the next Chancellor, though his lack of military experience was a serious concern. To cap it all off, Peter Davian had survived the crash landing and managed to evade capture. His task force was almost at the point of surrender when he waltzed back into their camp and took charge of the situation. The odds were stacked against them, but they were given a reprieve when Danemar withdrew his forces from Camel back to a secondary defensive line, a major blunder to begin his term of office. With Jade Castle abandoned and Winter Garden now back under the Prime Marshal's control, the Confederation was facing a catastrophe. Gerald Maddox's campaigns had seen some limited success in recovering their lost worlds, but the mood in the Freewells League was starting to shift 
as those in power questioned whether continuing the conflict was still prudent. The Captain General swore that he would not rest until all of their territory was reclaimed. Gerald's insistence on pursuing a course of war at a time when the Inner Sphere was beginning to seek a way out of it may have been his undoing. On March 3rd, 2861, he died suddenly from a heart attack. So goes the official story. There have been several suggestions over the years that members of Parliament took action to remove the Captain General, though these rumours are unsubstantiated. Maddox's death was exactly the kind of opportunity that Raymond Karpov had been hoping for when he convinced Gerald's son Maxwell to join the Comstar Order. If he returned to stake his claim, Karpov could maneuver a puppet ruler into control of one of the successor states. But curiously, this never took place. Various histories of the era contradict each other on Maxwell's time of death. Some state that he had predeceased his father, potentially after coming to blows with the First Circuit over his disinterest in the Captain General's position. As such, it was left to his aunt Philippa Maddock to step forward in his place. Undeterred by the missed opportunity, Raymond would welcome another young Maddock scion into the order the next year, Elizabeth Maddock. Philippa's policy on the matter of peace was much more agreeable to the war-weary populace, the polar opposite of her brother Gerald's. She too has often been named as one of the conspirators against him, but again, no evidence of foul play has ever been uncovered. On the topic of succession, Comstar was also undergoing changes to bring it more in line with Raymond Karpov's vision for a technocratic secret society. The Doctrinal Edict of 2861 had given the Primus the power to name a chosen successor as well as formalise the stratified organisational hierarchy. At the bottom were the Acolytes, then Adepts and Precentors above them. All other legacy roles were phased out. The First Circuit, which had expanded to 10 members back in 2857, remained the ruling council, answering only to the Primus. The militant ROM continued to expand, especially following the Vedder affair. Loki agent Rosemary Vedder had infiltrated Comstar three years prior and rose to the rank of adept, sending highly classified intel back to the Commonwealth during that time. More than three dozen other foreign agents in lower positions were discovered after the crackdown. Kurita's company store policy, their insidious plan to trap mercenaries in inescapable debt, leaving them no option but to sell off their units and sign up as regulars, had netted them a number of cheap acquisitions over the decades. Despite their growing reputation for underhandedness, it did not deter others from signing up with the successor state, such as the Isengrim in 2861. Another of their recent acquisitions had been the 12th Starguard just three years prior, but already there had been problems. The Ratfrags, one of the regiments within the Mercenary Brigade, had broken contract the previous year, citing a lack of payment. Tensions only escalated from there, until in 2861, the entire Starguard mutinied and returned to the Lyran Commonwealth, robbing Kurita of that same strength they had been so pleased to acquire. If there is a lesson to be learned, it is that once a mercenary command has reached sufficient size, it can be almost impossible to stop them from leaving if that's what they want to do. This loss did not deter them however, and the consensus within the DCMS is that the company store program has been a net positive for the military. With Kurita still firm advocates of the policy to the present day 3025, it remains to be seen whether this will cause issues for them again in the future. The Federated Sons juggernauts began moving again in 2861, this time with a greater focus on the St. Ives commonality. The two planets they had lost to Jade Castle were welcomed back into the Federated Suns, and another five border systems were added to the Capellan March. De Marlial seemed incapable of organising any sort of defence. By the mid-year, Michael Davian signed off on a bold plan to bring the war to a decisive end. 
a pair of daring raids were to be carried out by two of the best units within the AWFS, the 7th Cruiser's Lancers and Davian Assault Guards. Both understood that this could be a one-way trip. MIIO Intelligence placed the Chancellor in one of two locations, Cyan or St. Ives. Making use of uncolonized systems, they would journey to their targets and attempt to take Danemar hostage. The deeper of the two strikes took place first, shocking the Confederation that their enemy could reach their capital unopposed. It was the first time since Kurita had carried out skirmishing aerospace raids in the New Avalon system that a successor state capital had been targeted, and not since the famous Tamar Tigers raided Luthien back in the opening months of the First Succession War had troops made landfall. The Crucis Lancers did not find their quarry and promptly departed before the overwhelming Capellan forces could corner them. On July 5th, the Davian Guards arrived at St. Ives aboard FSS Resolve. Leading them in this reckless action was Michael's own daughter, Melissa Davian. Splitting her forces, she held back the Chancellor's personal guard while the rest of her regiment rained fire on the Liao Palace where Danemar was sheltering. The Chancellor's only hope was that the Capellan Hazars could break through before the assault guards breached his bunker. They very nearly did when they isolated Melissa from the rest of her unit, but before they could capitalize, Lieutenant Colonel Zolanda Dugan charged their position. She gave her life to ensure the safety of the Davian Air, one of only two mechs the AWFS lost during the mission. Though the assault guards were driven back from the Chancellor's palace, Danemar was so shaken that he dispatched a messenger to New Avalon in order to discuss terms for a ceasefire. The First Prince was caught off guard by the Liao proposal. He wisely held off issuing a response until after the Winter Garden attack scheduled for January 2862 had gone ahead, netting two more easy victories. But after a Capellan raid hit Redfield, he saw that the time was right to send a reply. His starting point in the negotiations was a demand that he knew no successor lord could possibly accept. He wanted the Capellan government to recognize Federated Sun's authority over not just the Winter Garden conquests, but every system that had changed hands since the fall of the Star League. Danemar agreed at once, handing Michael a shocking political victory. The peace agreement brought the Second Succession War to an end for the worlds along the Davian Liao border. With their flank secure, the Federated Sons began redeploying their entire military to face off against the Draconis Combine. The DCMS were racing to take what they could from the Commonwealth before the Rimwood threat grew too great to continue. With aid from the Nightmare's Merc unit, Alhilla and Karbala fell to the Dragon, but on October 19th, Coordinator Miyogi Kurita called a halt to all military operations. The supply situation was critical for many of their frontline units, and an attack on Emporia staged by the Razalhaeg regulars had to be abandoned. Steiner's other border was still under threat in 2862, as Magres yet again became the site of a battle. The Eredani Light Horse returned to capture Ilion, but there had been so much destruction wrought on that planet that it was virtually uninhabited by war's end. Soon after, Captain General Philippa Marek also ordered her troops to cease combat operations, after agreeing to an armistice between her family and Steiner's though not necessarily their states. Philippa's reasons for calling for peace were more than just appeasing her parliament and the sentiment of her people. Despite the humiliating terms Dame Marliao had agreed to with Davian, his military could now at least focus on the Free Wells League. The newest regiment of the Chesterton Reserves landed on Ling and began to lay waste to any targets of opportunity. Efforts by the Orloff Grenadiers to drive them off ended in disaster. Only after the Fusiliers seized a great wealth of spare parts for themselves did they depart. By the dawn of 2863, it was clear that the war was winding down. The final moves came in the vicinity of Terra. 
the Marek militia were already risking the tenuous ceasefire with Steiner when they launched a raid on Kallison, while a larger Liao task force took control of the capital of the city in concordance. The Federation of Sky were able to seize control of two more systems from the Kuzu prefecture. The very last gasp of the Second Succession War came in October 2863, when the famed stealths led a counterattack against the Curitan occupation of Sakhalin. Control of the fabled unit had passed to Raymond Winfield, with the 2nd Battalion under the command of former starlet Angela Franks, the famous Black Pearl. The Combine's new defensive posture served them well, inflicting heavy casualties on the stealths. A flanking attack nearly destroyed the unit outright, but Franks intervened at a crucial moment, stopping the advance almost single-handedly. It cost Angela her life when the enemy landed a hit on our cockpit that took the head of our battlemaster clean off. As the enemy mechs advanced on our retreating unit, the Black Pearl seemingly returned from beyond the grave to fire one more weapon salvo, killing the Kuritan commander, causing the DCMS to rout. Sakhalin was secure, as was Angela Frank's legacy. The stealths would ultimately be disbanded for the final time after their victory on Sakhalin, passing into legends themselves. Winfield was made Duke of Treeline, and the planet was later renamed after him. His descendants today lead an LCAF regiment that maintains many of the traditions and combat doctrine of their ancestors, operating out of a planet which had once belonged to the Rimworld's Republic that had first birthed the stealths. With this battle's conclusion, operations came to a halt along all the successor state borders. By December 2863, few of the Great Houses had managed to reach an agreement or sign an official ceasefire, but for all intents and purposes, the Second Succession War was over. And that concludes the penultimate chapter of the Second Succession War series. We have covered all the major events that have taken place since the conclusion of the First Succession War, barring one now. There is going to be an attempt to reach a formal peace between the five successor states. They're going to be meeting up within the next year to try and uh, agree on terms. You can guess how that goes. But that is the end of the fighting, at least for now. I think the most significant event to come out of this episode is the humiliation for the Capellan Confederation. The Second Succession War for them really is a disaster. It begins and ends with a huge loss of territory to the Federated Sons, and although it's a quieter period in the middle and they do make some gains against the Free Wills League, those are soon reversed and the whole time they are losing systems in isolated incidents. I think the only nation they make actual gains against is the Draconis Combine, weirdly enough, but uh, even there it's, it's relatively minor. The war does end with a couple of capitals under enemy control, so Robinson being the main one, but uh, Sirius as well for the Free Wills League. With everyone's focus now on restoring peace, launching a campaign to reclaim those worlds is going to have to come later, but as you can imagine, there are going to be sticking points for the nations involved there and there's not going to be much agreement or it's going to be difficult to reach an agreement uh, while they are under foreign occupation. I also set up a little bit of foreshadowing for events that are going to come much later in this series. In the Free Wells League, where a former Comstar pre-center will rise to the position of Captain General, it happens more than once in their history. And also in the Draconis Combine, where their company store policy that has worked so well for them over the years eventually comes back to bite them in the ass. Like I said, next time we're going to be looking at the Inner Sphere's attempt to reach some sort of formal peace between themselves, but we're also going to be reviewing the changes that have taken place across the Second Succession War, but also all the way back to the Star League, yeah, covering events of the First Succession War as well. We're going to look at who has gained the most, who has lost the most. We're also going to do another review of the militaries that year, and you'll see just how much they have crumbled in the last 35 years. But that about wraps things up for now. Thank you very much for watching guys, I hope you have enjoyed this series. We've only got one more chapter to go, that'll be coming out next weekend, next Saturday. After that I'm hoping to upload the full series compilation very soon after, within a week of that finale coming out. 
If you want to support this channel you can do so by giving this video a like or leaving me a comment. I read every comment that I get and I do try to respond to as many of you as I can. Sharing this video around with other people in the Battletech community also really helps. And if you want to go one step further in your support or if you want early access to the videos before their premieres on YouTube, you can find a link to my Patreon account in the description. With this series close to concluding, by the time this video comes out I'm probably already in full script writing mode for the third succession war. I've also got a couple other side projects planned for the Battletech series uh, and I'll mix and match those throughout May, that's the plan at least. You don't need to be a patron to read the progress updates on my Patreon account if you want to track how I'm progressing with writing the Third Succession War. So thank you once again for watching, and I hope to see you again next weekend for the finale of the Second Succession War.